Welcome. I'm so glad to spend this morning on this beautiful spring morning with you. And I just want to have a special welcome to those of you joining us online. I'm so glad that you get to be with us here this morning and experience the morning together. My name is Angie, and I'm part of the leadership team. And you guys, here at Crossroads, everything we do is about drawing people and ourselves closer to Jesus. And so every weekend when we say our mission statement that we are multi-generational and multi-ethnic, creating disciples of the next generation. What we mean is that we, everything that we do, our sermons, our programs, our groups, it's all about drawing closer to Jesus. And we invite you into that mission. Whether you've been here with us for decades or you're brand new and today is your first day, we invite you into that. Now, if you are brand new with us today, we would love to get to know you. We wanna hear your story. And we've made that process really simple. You simply text the word new to the number on the screen and somebody will be, get in touch with you. Now, some mornings on Sunday, we get to experience that drawing closer to Jesus through baptism. Baptism is an opportunity for somebody to share the story of what God's doing in their life, and then we get to come alongside them and celebrate that journey with them. And this morning, you are in for a treat because we have not one, but two very precious baptisms. So take a look at the story of what God's doing in Owen and, Ka- and, and Braley's life. Take a look. So I am Owen's mom, and Owen is eight years old, and I have seen um, Owen come to Jesus um, with the last two years. Um, Just with signing, he'll sign like Jesus, Um, he'll say church, Um, he'll say God, Um, and sometimes it's just random at night. He'll just put his hands together and tell me he wants to pray. Um, It's not like I'm telling him like, okay, Owen, let's pray together. He'll just kind of come up to me put his hands uh, and then sign Jesus. And I know right then that he wants to learn more about Jesus um, and that he's really, as an individual, come to Jesus himself than me pushing it as a mom saying, let's follow Jesus, let's go to church, let's read the Bible. He wants to learn about Jesus more than just me pushing it to him or experiences through me. And you said, you shared with me, he even loves to share that with other people. Oh yeah, Owen loves to go up to people and he'll sign like, Jesus loves you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, it's just so sweet to see that he can sign it without, you know, me telling him like, say Jesus, say this. Like, he just wants to spread Jesus' love. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so neat. I had an opportunity to spend time with Rachel and Owen several weeks ago, and I learned a lot. I got to observe Owen's ability to discern for himself what he needs to make cognitive decisions based on those needs and those wants and to communicate that with us on his own, that he he knows what he needs and he knows what he wants. And I, for a season, had an opportunity to work with children just like Owen who are nonverbal. And what I learned out of that season was that if you're willing to listen in a little bit different way, they have a lot to say. They will share a lot with you about what's going on and what they're thinking. But the biggest thing that I came away with and out of observation was understanding every child understands and is uniquely designed to know and love Jesus. Definitely. And he loves Jesus. Oh, he loves Jesus. And it's just amazing to see because if you don't see it in a different eye, mm-hmm. you would never know that he'd want to get baptized yep. and that he wanted to follow Jesus. Yep. But you have to pick up on those signs when they're ready. Yep. So yep. I think, I mean, I think it's wonderful and I'm, I'm just happy as a mom that like he wanted to do it and that he got baptized and you know, it's his own story. It's not my story. It's, it's how he wants it. Absolutely. And he is uniquely created by God to know and love Jesus too. Definitely. That's so neat. It's been so fun to watch. and I'm in sixth grade. I like drawing and writing stories a lot. I always wanted to go to church, but with my brother, we really couldn't. So I asked my parents a lot of times if we could go, and then we finally went. My favorite thing about church is learning about Jesus more and hearing a lot of Christian music. Mainly, Jesus became real to me when I was like, 
10, I think, because then that's when my brother got like very sick and had to stay in the hospital a lot. So I had to pray a lot, and then like he became better over time. So then I'm like, oh, Jesus and God helps me a lot with that. Well, sometimes me and my brother will dance to like Christian music, and then I'll feel like God's watching me and like he's like clapping with me and stuff. Kind of changed that I know that Jesus is always by my side, and that if things get tough, then I always have him. My name's Bailey Hurtado, and I have accepted Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Yeah. Briley, on the basis of your testimony, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you how excited I am uh, to watch uh, their family, this family that we just watched get baptized, continue to grow in their faith. If you've been here at part of Crossroads for the last couple of uh, months, then you might recognize Rachel, the mother there, actually got baptized six months ago. And then her kids, Briley and Owen, get baptized uh, this week and today. And man, just what a spectacular uh, moment just to be able to experience the way that God is working in and through that family. And uh, Jeff, the dad there, just an amazing guy. And so I'm so excited just to see their story, to hear their story uh, as they move through and uh, as we watch them. Front row seats, we have front row seats uh, to watching God move in and through their lives. And so I want to welcome all of you joining us online at Crossroads ABC, Facebook, YouTube, as well as Fort Lupton and here at Thornton. It is uh, good to be together today as we come together and worship to, uh, together Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus. If you are brand new with us, and we haven't had the privilege of meeting. My name is Matt Manning. I'm the senior pastor here at Crossroads Church. And the beautiful picture of this baptism today and the family, the Hidalgo family, is just a great entry point into what we've been doing the last couple of weeks, which is all about parenting. We're in this series where we're looking at the six truths that every parent needs to know. Now, these aren't like the, the everything that a parent needs to know. There's a lot of books and all kinds of things out there that will help you with all kinds of things. But we are looking at really specifically these six truths that we get from Scripture that every parent, that we think every parent needs to know. And the reason that we're doing this series is because first and foremost, we realize that when it comes to parenting, parenting is important, isn't it? That whether you are a parent, you have a parent, you know someone who's a parent, that we all realize how important this task of parenting is uh, that God has given us to do. And not only is it important, but it's incredibly difficult, isn't there? There's very few things in my life that have humbled me or shown me my weaknesses like parenting. In fact, just kind of a show of hands, how many of you would agree that parenting's a pretty tough job? Uh, yeah, most all of us. Yeah, there's, it's pretty universal. Now, I, uh, I came across the quote this week uh, talking about parenting. It's from Mark Twain, you know, the great author and writer. And they were talking about the importance and the significance of parenting, as well as some of his advice. And in the midst of the conversation, somebody asked him, like, what's his advice when it comes to teenagers? And here's what he wrote. I thought this was pretty good. When they're 13 years old, put them in a barrel and nail the lid shut, then feed them through the knot hole. <laughs> like that's the, that was Twain's advice. I thought that was pretty good. When it comes to parenting, uh, there is nothing that I've experienced quite in my life like the joys of parenting, and there's nothing quite like the hardships of parenting. And yet, one of the great things I love about parenting is the joy that comes from parenting. Like I have this library of awesome things or funny things that my kids have done, goofy stuff that they've been a part of. For example, in the Manning house, uh, we love our homemade ice cream. And so in the summer, we make every excuse to have homemade ice cream. And we have this recipe that's from my family. I don't know, it's like over 100 years old. And it tastes like a Wendy's Frosty, only better, if you can like imagine that, when it's done. And so oftentimes we'll make it together. And so one summer, several, several years ago, my son, Cademan, my middle son, who's now 11, was just three. And we had made it, it finished, so we'd set it on the, on the countertop. I had walked outside to do something real quick, and I came in, and this is what I caught him doing, was just... <laughs> downing the whole thing, right? And it's these moments in life that just give, like, you know, the great joy of being a parent that just brings a smile to my face. And as we go through this series, part of our intention and our hope is that we're praying that you would get the strength and the encouragement 
that you would realize that, that really every day when it comes to parenting is a joy, and that if you're a parenthood, that God would make all the years of your life with your, uh, with your kids very, very blessed. And so that's what this whole series is about. And so we're walking through these six truths. Like I said, it's not everything to know about parenting, but these six truths that we find in Scripture. And as a ray of like a roadmap of where we're going and where we've been, uh, I'm just going to walk through the six truths real quick with you. And so if you were here first week, week one, we looked at the first truth of what you do matters and what you do makes a difference. And we really explored this question of, of what, do you, what do you say is successful parenting? Like if I was come to you and I was asked the question of you, like what does a successful parent look like? How would you answer that? And what we found as we explored that topic is that oftentimes what we say successful parenting looks like and what the Bible has to say actually are a little bit opposed to each other. That They don't agree on the same thing. In fact, when it comes to successful parenting for us, we would say, I'm a successful parent if my kid never experienced hardship or if I'm able to provide for all of their needs or if my child grows up and gets a good career, a spouse, a couple of kids, right, a house. Like, like that would be a success as a parent, that I would deem myself successful as a parent. And yet, as we open up the scriptures, one of the things that we find as we read through the scriptures is that our success as a parent, at least from God's perspective, has very little to do with those things that I just mentioned. In fact, when it comes to God's perspective on parenting, a success as a parent looks like us taking the opportunities time and time again to create space in our kids' life where they have the opportunity to hear about the existence of God and to see his goodness. That the Bible says what you do matters, what you do makes a difference. And then week two, we talked about the second truth, which in my opinion is probably the most important truth that we face as parents, which is this, that you're not a parent because you're able. That all of us have those feelings of inadequacy, where we feel incapable and able to do the task of parenting that's been given to us. And oftentimes we feel like we're just not able to do the task that's been given to us. And that's where God's grace meets us in this world, that God has given his grace to us, and because of his grace, God doesn't call us to be a parent because we're able. He calls us to be a parent because we're willing. And in our willingness, as we step into that, uh, God's grace and willingness, that God gives us the tools and the things necessary in order to bring about uh, our child, or to raise our child in good ways. Today, we're talking about truth number three, which is character formation is greater than behavioral modification. Then, week four, we'll talk about the best change happens slowly over time. Week five, heartbreak happens. And then we'll wrap it all up with the final truth that your parenting, your parenting is shaped or influenced by your identity, all right? So that's the roadmap. That's where we're headed. Today, we're talking about how character formation is greater than behavioral modification, all right? Now, All of this has to do with character, what the Bible calls character, what we call character. So as a way of getting us started today, I want to ask you a series of questions for you to ponder, all right? Here we go. Why is it that every child, regardless of their age, tends to be impatient? Why is it when it comes to your children, do they tend to fight with one another? Why does every child seemingly have to be the first one in line And why does that never go away as we grow older? Why does every child, again, regardless of age, find it easier to be served rather than to serve? Why is it that they feel like they're always getting the short end of the stick? Why is it that every child, again, regardless of age, whether they're little, big, or they're big and have bigs, why is it that every child, when it comes to being wrong, excuses rather than confesses? See, the one thing that all of these questions point to is, again, what we call character. And here's where we need to begin, that as a parent, you are never, ever just dealing with the words and actions of your children. You are never, ever just dealing with the words and actions of your children. You are always dealing with what controls their behavior, which is the heart. Now, sadly, for many of us parents, myself included, we so quickly lose sight of that reality or someone never even taught us taught it to us. And so consequently, what we do is we spend all of our time, all of our energy, all of our focus thinking that our jobs as parents is to simply direct and make sure that our children behave well. And so we walk around, we walk around like home security guards enforcing the law around the house. Now, what I want to say is this, and please listen to me, when it comes to rules, rules are important. That rules are important. That your child's obedience, your child's behavior is important. That when we open up the Bible, the law 
has a huge place of importance in our lives, and we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like in a few minutes. When it comes to authority, your kids need to understand and, and know what it means to submit to authority, particularly your authority when they're younger. It's your responsibility to teach that to them so that as they grow older, they know what legitimate authority and submission looks like so that they're able to apply that in the world in which they live, both culturally and spiritually. However, as important as those two things are, what we lose sight of, what we need to realize is that the problem of humanity, generally speaking, and specifically speaking of your children, is that their character is still being developed. And because they lack character, they stumble not doing what is right, not doing what is good, not doing what is kind or loving. And much of, much of the wrong in this world, that we face in this world, as humans, as adults, much of the wrong is because of our lack of character. Now, when it comes to the Bible and understanding the way that the Bible perceives or understands character, it has everything to do with the heart. In the Bible, we have this guy named Solomon. And Solomon, if you're unaware of him, is often considered the wisest man who ever lived in this, on this world, on this earth. He was the third king of Israel. And during his lifetime, he sat down and he wrote this book to his sons. And in it, what he's trying to do is actually convince his sons or help his sons understand how God sees the world and how God's functioning in the world. Like, like this is the way that the world works according to God. That's what the book of Proverbs is all about. And so we have this wise father writing these writings or giving these writings to his sons in order that they might see God in the world. And in it, he writes these words in Proverbs 4.23. For some of you, this might be your life verse. Keep your heart with all diligence. For from it flows the springs of life. That keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Now, like I said, if you've been around church, this is probably a pretty familiar verse to you. For some of you, it might be a life verse of yours. But Solomon is looking at his sons, and he says, Boys, if you're to focus on anything in this world, make it this. Like, make this the priority. Don't get distracted. Don't go down paths of foolishness. Keep your eyes on this. Keep your heart with all diligence. Son, pay attention to the content and the character of your heart because from it flows the springs of life. Now, what Solomon is saying is that the character of your child, and parents, let's not remove ourselves too far from this. This is about us too. But what Solomon is saying is that the character of your child, his actions, his words, his respect, his, his behaviors, all of that flows from his heart. That biblically speaking, the heart is the causal core of your child's identity. That everything that you see on the outside of your child flows from his heart. Like you and I, we know that what on the inside is more significant than what we see on the outside. It's the same with your child, that the causal core of your child's identity is his or hers heart, that their character is driven by whatever is ruling their heart. So what this means for us then is when they say things to others that is energized by anger or hatred or bitterness or jealousy or selfishness, all of that is first and foremost a heart problem. And while you can put some rules around it that maybe modifies their behavior for a season, that you're not actually getting to the root of the cause that's driving all of these actions. Or it means that when they lash out against your authority, when they go against the rules that you have in a house intentionally when they're younger, when they make decisions that go against those rules, or when they're growing older and they just make foolish decisions, what it means is that first and foremost, this is an issue of their hearts. And while you can modify their behavior and put some rules in place that will maybe help for a season, you're not actually dealing with the core of what's driving their decisions. That when it comes to parenting, it's not enough to just simply modify behavior, that we have to constantly have focus and an intention on their hearts. Because as Solomon says, from it flows the springs of life. So the fundamental problem then is the heart, and the question that drives from that is if the fundamental problem of our children is their heart, then what do we as children or as parents do? Like if the fundamental issue of my child is their heart, not their behaviors, then what are we as parents to do? Well, unfortunately, 
For most of us, when answering that question, we cater or fall to the fatal flaw of parenting, which reduces all parenting down to rules and regulations. Like, that's all that there is. That we announce, we threaten, and then enforce the rules. Now, hear me out on this. When it comes to rules, rules are important. Rules, a house that has no rules is not a very safe house. That rules put the norms of the house together. The rules help place boundaries. They, they put in things that are, are safe and say, stay away from these things that are, that are unsafe. That rules bring order. Rules are needed. But the one thing that rules never do is deliver your child from foolishness. Rules never change their heart. Just a quick survey I'm going to ask you to participate in, all right? You can raise your hand. How many of you live in a household, whether you grew up in one, you're growing up in one, or you're parent of a household, but, but how many of you are in a household that expects honesty? Just go ahead and raise your hands. Yeah, all of us, good. How many of you work at a place of employment, whether you own a business or you're just working in this place of business, where honesty is a value? Go ahead and raise your hands. Yeah, all of us again, good. All right, all right here's the truth telling, or here's the honesty moment, okay? How many of you have ever told a lie? <laughs> all of us, haven't we? Well, didn't you know that was against the rules? Right? Like, of course you did. You just all raised your hands and you told me that the place in which you live, the place in which you work, that the expectation is honesty, that there's a value of honesty, that it's against the rules to lie, and yet every single one of us has done it. Here's the point. The point is, is that rules have a place in our lives. From the Bible's perspective, rules, rules, or what the Bible calls the law, helps us show our shortcomings, our transgressions, our sins. What the law does wonderfully is it reveals those things to us. It shows us who we are. That the, the law is powerful in showing us who it is that we actually are. But listen, it has zero power, zero power in correcting the heart and delivering from it springs of life. So the sweat question still remains, doesn't it? Like, if the fundamental issue of my child is their heart, then what do we do as parents? Well, what might be helpful for us is to look at Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, you have the Apostle Paul, the great missionary who wrote like half the New Testament. He's writing this letter to the Roman church, and in it, he's talking about the gospel of Jesus. Now, if you've never read the book of Romans, I would encourage you just to set aside some time and to read it in, in complete. Like, just read it from the beginning to end. It won't take you very long. It'll be well worth your time. Because you may or may not know this, but actually universities used the book of Romans for years to train their people who were going through and getting law degrees and how to present and then defend an argument. That what Paul is doing is that he's giving the argument for what we call the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. And he begins by speaking about our sin and our heart and our character and then what that looks like in light of God and then the grace of God that comes through Jesus and then applies it in the end for us of now what does this make any difference? Why does this make any difference in our lives? And in the beginning, in Romans chapter 1, Paul makes this stunning connection for us when it comes to our character. That he describes your heart. He describes the heart of our children. He describes what's going on in our child's heart. And so we pick up the reading where Paul is explaining what sin does functionally to our hearts. And here's what he writes, Romans chapter 1, verse 25. He says, because, talking about all of humanity here, because they exchanged the truth, here's the problem, about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Paul says, here's the fundamental problem of humanity, that they, they, stopped, they stopped believing in a way. They exchanged the truth for a lie when it came to God, and they exchanged their worship for the things that were created rather than the creator. And he says, this has huge consequences on us as people. It has a huge consequence on our hearts and on the hearts of our children because here's the consequence of this action, verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, the list goes on. Their gossips, slanders, Haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die. 
they not only did them, but then they gave their approval to those who practiced them. See, according to Paul, the issue of our character, what plagues our heart, is tied to one of the most fundamental practices, one of the most fundamental things about humanity, and that is worship. That the truth of this passage is, is that your heart, your child's heart, is always being governed by someone or something. That there is a war that is being waged for the throne of your child's heart. What governs your child's heart will ultimately shape and determine how he or she deals with the situations and relationships of everyday life. That the way that this battle is being waged for the throne of your child's heart, who's ever sitting on that throne, will shape and determine how he or she deals with the situations and relationships of everyday life. Let me give you a couple examples of how this works out. If what rules your child's heart is a need to, for control, the need to be right, then consequently what that will look like is a world where your authority is constantly being butted up against where your child is constantly fighting your authority. Now, when we look at the scriptures, there is nothing inherently wrong with wanting to be right. Being right is good. But when that becomes the driving force of your child's life, of your child's heart, then your child will be endlessly argumentative in this life. Maybe it's pleasure for your child. That pleasure, again, biblically speaking, pleasure is not wrong. God created pleasure. That when it comes to pleasure, God created an entire world for, to be, for us to enjoy and to seek pleasure in. That pleasure in and of itself is not a bad thing. But if pleasure is the driving, motivating force of your child's heart, then she will never respond appropriately to situations and, more importantly, to the relationships in her life. That she will never be able to serve others. She will never be able to love others because she will constantly be consumed with herself. Maybe it's acceptance. Maybe it's the acceptance that, that governs your child's heart. The, the core of who we've been created to be is that all of us need a level of acceptance in our lives. But as adults, every single one of us knows that when, that when human acceptance is the governor of our heart, the driving motivated factor of our heart, that we all know that we make decisions that aren't always in, that aren't always the wisest, that aren't always the best for us. It's the same with your child. Perhaps it's stuff or, or money. Listen, having things to enjoy, having material possessions, having cash, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, in January, we did a whole series on money. And as we walk through it, never once, you're not going to find it anywhere in the Bible that will ever say having material possessions or having money is bad. You'll never find it anywhere. But if money or stuff, possessions, material possessions, is sitting on the throne of your child's heart, then they will only ever experience dissatisfaction and discontentment in this world. See, as parents, this is where it gets so practical. Is if you just take a moment, and if you were just to, to answer the question, what, like, what does it, what is the motivating factor driving my child's heart? Like, like who's sitting on the throne of my child's heart? Like, like how, would you, how would you answer that? What would be the primary motive there? See, the connection between our heart, the character of your child's heart, and worship is incredibly helpful when it comes to understanding the lives of our children. Paul says that when their worship is out of alignment, here's what happens. Verse 28, they're filled with all manners of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossipers, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, heart, heartless, and ruthless. And as parents, we look at that list, and it's a little bit hard to hear, isn't it? It's, I mean, we want to push back and go, not, not my kid. Like, my kid, he's got a good heart. Johnny, Johnny's got a good heart. And Paul goes, well, let's just take the easy ones on the list. How about envy? Have you ever had to enter into conflict because little Johnny with a heart of gold, with a heart of gold, has been jealous of someone or something in his life? Yeah. Well, what about strife? I mean, if Johnny has a sibling, when was the last time that you got through a day, day where you didn't have to break up the fight between Johnny and his siblings? Maybe you would go, the last time? Like when I took his mom into Disney World and left him at home. Like, maybe that's the answer, right? How about deceit? Has your child ever told you a lie? Gossip. 
How often do you have to have a conversation with little Johnny about stories that he tells? It's not about tearing down people so they can build himself up. Disobedience to parents, check all the time. So at a minimum, Paul says little Johnny with the heart of gold is a disobedient, envious fighter who's full of deceit and gossip. At the end of the day, that's who little Johnny is. Now, it might be very hard for us to hear as parents, not, not only does this list capture the things that you have to deal with in your own life, in the lives of your children every day, but it also gives us insight on how to deal with them. And here's where it becomes so practical for us. Because you can put rules and regulations, you can make law that maybe for a season will help keep them from doing the things that they're not supposed to do or doing the things that they're supposed to do. But the heart of your child doesn't need behavior modification. The heart of your child needs realignment. It needs worship realignments. And so here's the question that we have to ask. Is the heart of your child controlled by the love of the creator or by the craving of something in creation? See, in every single situation, that's the question that's being asked. On the throne of your child's heart, is it the love of the creator or the craving for something in creation? That's the question. That's, that sets the job description for, for you and, and for me as we live out our lives as, as parents. That every, every moment that you're dealing with, that's the question that's being asked. And so today, if you were to go home and you were to ask your child to help you do something, and if their answer to you was no, and then you followed that up with another question of going, little Johnny, like, why did you say no? Why wouldn't you help dad with this? They will never be able to give you a good answer because at the end of the day, they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. That it's your responsibility to help unfold the deep mysteries of their hearts. To make the connections for them that are not only insight giving and wise, but also transformational. That they need you to do more. They need you to do more than announce their failures and to dole out punishments in their life. That they need you to capture these opportunities, these moments. Because these moments are where God is giving you a view into your child's heart. That God is giving you these moments of insight, revealing your child's heart to the things that he does not know or does not see or does not understand. So that with grace that you can reveal them to him so that the Holy Spirit can come and work doing the things like bringing about concern and conviction and confession into their hearts, which is is the character development that they need most. See, every moment that you get a glimpse into your child's heart is a moment of grace. It's a blessing for you as a parent. Now, oftentimes we don't think about it that way, myself included, do we? That oftentimes when, our, when we get a glimpse of our heart that's a little bit hard to see, when we, it's hard to see our child's hearts, we don't think of it as a blessing. We oftentimes think of it as a curse. True story. That six months ago, I was working on this sermon series. I was putting it all together. I outlined it. I had ready to go. It was good to go so that we could get here and we could just go about preaching it and, and doing what we needed to do. And I kid you not, not 30 minutes after I got this series done, did I get a phone call where I entered into the most difficult season of parenting that I've ever faced. And in those moments, it was hard to see this as a blessing. It was hard to see this as a blessing. And yet as I step back, I look at the love of God, and I think to myself how loving he is that in one family, in one house, somewhere in the world, that he chose to reveal our hearts and what's going on in our hearts so that we could see and be redeemed and rescued in them. And his love is so great that it's not only just happening in one family, in one house, somewhere in the world, it's happening in every house of every family all around the world every day. That when your child's heart has been exposed, you are not being cursed, you are being graced. That God can turn these moments of, into redemption, of moments of redemption, And the really cool thing is, is that God is inviting you into the front seat of your child's life. That every time you get a glimpse of your child's heart, that God is inviting you into the front seat of their lives. And what your child needs is not just a firm no and punishments. What your child needs is the care from a person who loves them, who will take the time and opportunity to help them see what's going on deep inside of them. 
and how it's shaping the way that they're living their lives. Let me say it again. Those conversations are not curses. Those conversations, those opportunities are opportunities that God gives to you where your heart change happens, where hearts are transformed. Now, listen, these verses that we're looking at today, they're not just descriptive of our children's hearts. They're descriptive of our hearts as well. And the question that every single one of us has to wrestle with today is the same question that we ask of our child, who's sitting on the throne of our hearts? Is it the love of the creator or is it something, something the craving of something in creation? Like who's sitting on the throne of your hearts? And the list that, that Paul speaks through here is as much application for my own life as it is any of my three kids. And as I look at that list, there's some discouragement in that, that I'm a lot more like that list than I want to be. But because of Jesus' work on the cross, that he's able to root out at the very core the sin, the transgressions, the, the shortcomings that I have in my life, and then through grace to help me see that I'm worshiping something or someone else besides him. And in doing so, he brings about the character out of my life with the space for it to grow and to flourish. And what I found to be true is that when it comes to my relationship with Jesus, when Jesus is at the center of my worship, not only do I get to share with my kids through both my successes and my failures how God is shaping me, but that my kids get to see what it looks like, what a heart looks like that's chasing after God each and every day. Each and every day. See, the truth of our lives is that it's not only about our kids who don't need behavior modification, but oftentimes, even in our own lives, we live as if that's the way forward. That if I can just live by the rules and the regulations, if I can just modify my behavior enough to get by, then I'll be good. And if you're tired of running that race, then we would love to invite you into a relationship with Jesus who will begin to shape your character, who will renew your heart, and from it will flow the springs of life that we all desire. Before we go to communion, will you pray with me, Father? Lord, we know that your presence is among us, and um, Lord, as we look at these passages in, in Proverbs and in Romans, uh, Lord, we're confronted with the own issues, our, our own issues in our lives, of where our heart's at, of who's sitting on the throne of our lives. And so, Father, today I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to ask that question and that through it, Lord, that you would reveal what's going on in our hearts. And as you do that, Lord, I pray that we would fall upon your grace, that we would fall upon your grace, that we would fall at the foot of the cross, Lord, with confession and conviction and awareness of what's going on. And, Lord, as the battle wages in our hearts for the throne, Lord, I pray that we would always choose you. And in doing so, Lord, we would help our kids. We would help our kids with their own worship realignment in their life. And Lord, that we would be able to come alongside them, battling alongside them the motivations and the struggles that they face in this world. Lord, I pray that you would help us see that, that as we live out our lives, that the outcome of our lives really flows from the inward realities of our hearts. And so, Lord, change our hearts, change our kids' hearts. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. If you've never had the opportunity to know Jesus and the grace that we talk about that comes with knowing him and being in relationship with him, we would love to have that opportunity to share with you. You can simply text the word Jesus to 720-513-1933, and we'll have that conversation with you. Today, as we come together as a church to celebrate communion. We're reminded that in the darkness of our hearts that Jesus came and his body was broken on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven. That his blood was poured so that we might have life. And so today we celebrate as a church together that reality, that truth of God walking with us, giving us hope, bringing us life. And so we celebrate together by eating the bread. and drinking the cup. Over the next 20 minutes or so, if you need prayer, we would love to pray for you. Under the sign that says prayer over here, you can just make your way. If you need prayer today online, you can click the button. 
But I'm going to invite you all to stand as we sing about the promises of God that are true in our life today. says that the Lord is faithful to all promises. Amen. So if there's a promise in your life that you are thankful for, I dare you to just say thank you, Jesus. Let's thank him. Take one second to say thank you, Lord, for all the promises that you've made. Thank you, Lord, for promising us eternal life with you. We thank you. And if you're motivated today to thank him, feel free to sing with us. God of Abraham, he's the God of covenants and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word. It will come. faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your you believe that God is faithful in your life. Think back over what he's done for you. He's been way too good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow out
thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness.
so much more. We're looking to a new horizon. We're praying for your rain to pour. An overflowing of true redemption. An overflowing of your kingdom. Just receive it, receive the freedom. Oh, can you feel it? Heaven is reaching. Oh, can you hear it? Our God is speaking. Oh, can you see it? He's got your healing. Oh, just receive it. question we got asked today. Are my kids' hearts pursuing after the creator or are they pursuing after something in creation? What a challenging question for my husband and I to unpack this week together, to process through this week together. And I'm so grateful that we don't have to do it alone. We have a precious, beautiful community group of friends that will help us with that challenging question together. Now, if you haven't found your way into community group, do not fear. My friend Tiffany's here and she's going to let you know how to get that, how, how, how to have that happen. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. We've made it very easy for you, and you can actually do it right where you are with your phone. There is a number on the screen, and if you're new with us today, text the word new. We just want to make a connection and know that you're here, introduce ourselves to you, and welcome you. And maybe you're ready for a next step. Maybe you are ready to step into a community and do life with other people and find that support. Text the word next to that number. We can help you do that. And finally, maybe something about today sparked you and you realize in this journey, whether it's parenting or not, even in an influential relationship with a young child, you need Jesus. And maybe you've realized that today and you have questions. Text the word Jesus so we can begin that conversation as well. Thanks, Tiff. Now, if you consider Crossroads Church your home and you would like to partner with us in generosity, we've made that process simple as well. You can give your financial gifts online through our app or our website, or if you're with us in the building, you can give them on your way out. Crossroads, we thank you for your generosity. The things that we get to do together because of it to his glory is quite amazing. Now, before we get to our blessing, we have one request of you. We have a fun program called Peak, and Peak is our discipleship program for our littles all the way up to our teenagers, and they have a big event tonight. And so if you wouldn't mind helping us stack chairs on your way out, if you are able, that would be incredible. We stack them in, in rows of eight, and it's kind of fun when we do it together. So thank you for that. Thank you, Angie. I invite you to lift your hands. I would love to send you out this week with a blessing from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Friends, I pray this week that you, as you step out, understand and feel and are aware of the hope that Jesus gives us. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Amen. See you guys later.